With the recent outbreak of coronavirus, you might be wondering why is it spreading faster in some regions than others? Why is my city taking certain preventative measures when others aren't? And why are schools closing down in one state and not another? We can gain insight into all of these questions by modeling social networks. Now I'm not talking about Facebook and Twitter, but rather a computational tool used to track human interactions. In this video, we're going to answer the questions, what is a social network? How can they help us predict the spread of viruses? And how can they inform our policies to help reduce spreading? So let's begin. First, what is a social network? Simply put, a social network is a group of people who interact. This could be a classroom, a business, or an entire city. To make analyzing their behavior easier, we represent them as a graph. Each dot or node represents a person and the lines connecting them represent their connections to other people. By studying the structure of social networks, we can gain insight into any socially contagious phenomenon. This could be how a piece of gossip spreads, how friendship circles work, or how fast a fashion trend takes off. Viruses are transmitted by person-to-person -person contact, which makes social networks perfect for studying and predicting their behaviour. If we can guess what the virus will do next, we can better know how to stop it. Of course, not all social networks are the same, and their structure is very influential over how a virus will spread. If I asked you which social network you'd rather be a node in during a deadly virus outbreak, which would you choose? Most of you hopefully chose this one. Both of these networks have 15 nodes, but we can tell intuitively just from looking that this one has a lot more connections. If this node gets infected, it will take just two steps before the entire network is infected. While if the same node in this network is infected, it will take six. By lowering the average number of connections of the network, we can slow down a virus. Another important factor to consider is the layout of the network. For example, the amount of clustering. Both of these networks have 16 connected nodes, but we can see that in this one, one of the nodes is more important in a virus outbreak. If we can prevent the central node from being infected, this could potentially quarantine a virus. In a network like this, closing down an airport or border would be very effective. In this network, however, closing down an airport wouldn't have much of an effect, as there are still plenty of other connections for the virus to spread across. Modeling clusters helps us predict which nodes to target for the best chance of prevention. This brings us to our next property, centrality. How centralized is the network? Both of these networks have 16 nodes and an average of 1.9 connections per node. But you can see that they're very different. The first one is much more centralized, meaning that the center node is extremely influential over the rest of the network. If that node gets infected, it's basically game over for the whole network. A policy that would help this network is something that would remove the central node, like a popular person self-isolating or a gym closing down. We can see that the number of nodes in a network and the average number of connections between them isn't always enough to treat them the same way. The shape and the way the nodes are connected is very influential over the path the virus takes. This is why cities with very similar populations can see huge variation in infected numbers. Of course, these networks are very simple. The real world is much more complicated with thousands, even millions of nodes with a messy mix of all characteristics in a single social network. So how do computer scientists use these models in the real world? Well, with the enormous computing power available on the cloud, computer scientists can model very large networks using publicly available data, or census data. From a single household, a large map can be constructed. This is then repeated for every household in a region. By modeling the interactions of every individual in every household, we can get a lot of information about how a virus might spread. This in turn informs the best actions for prevention. What's even better is that prevention strategies can be simulated to see how effective they'll be. If we wanted to see the effect of closing schools in a particular state, we could subtract out all the school interactions and see how that affects the network. If we wanted to see how effective a travel ban might be, 
we subtract out all nodes connected to travel and see how the virus's path changes. Each country, state and city has its own unique social network. As we've seen, the same prevention strategy will affect different networks in very different ways. Closing a border in one country will not necessarily be as effective as closing a border in another. These models help us balance prevention strategies with economic needs. It's important to remember that modelling the real world is a very difficult task and can be highly unpredictable. One drawback is that it's nearly impossible to factor in random events. Like an infected family might suddenly decide to go on their dream vacation to Disneyland. These random acts can have huge unpredictable butterfly effects. Another limitation is that it's very difficult to predict how people's behaviour will change as they become more aware of the virus. Unlike the weather, which doesn't change depending on how many people know about it, the behaviour of a virus epidemic will change as people become more aware and start acting differently. It's very hard to predict or model these changes before they happen, and of course the lack of reliable data and underreporting doesn't help. Even the best models are usually days, if not weeks, behind. Even though social network modelling can't provide all the answers, it's a useful tool to help us fight this virus as best we can. With today's computing power and access to public data, we're more equipped than ever before to predict COVID-19's next move. Stay safe, everyone.